Hello, everybody. My name is Steve Colson. And um, just hold that thought a second. So this is me offering a silent uh, prayer to the tiki gods that I can get through this presentation without using my notes. We're on the podium over here. But it does have bearing on the conversation we're going to have. My name is Steve Colson. I'm a creative director and a partner at uh, an agency in New York called Campfire. Campfire's mission is to connect brands and uh, entertainment properties with fan communities using storytelling experiences, immersive storytelling experiences. So I live and I work in the US, although as you can tell from my accent, I grew up here in the UK. In fact, I spent a lot of my formative years here, those years that really affect what you do for the rest of your life. And for me, those formative years were the period between the breakup of the Beatles and the formation of the Sex Pistols. It's that period of British culture that brought us glam rock, right? T-Rex, Slade, Roller Mania, the Wombles. <laughs> I'm just entering my head now. Uh, uh, the Multicolored Swap Shop, Mike Yarwood, the Rally Chopper. Did anybody hear of a Rally Chopper? Oh, I see a couple. One of my favorite bikes of all time, the Rally Chopper, Pop Rocks. It was also a period before cheap flights to Benidorm really changed the way the British took their holidays. And so when I was growing up every year, my parents and I, we would strap our suitcases to the roof of our Ford Capri and jet off to exotic destinations east-west, which in our case always meant one place, and that was Butlin's holiday camps. Now, for those of you under 30, you might not remember or even know what an amazing pop culture experience Butlin's holiday camps in the 60s and 70s really were. Now, it's true that they were kind of flimsy in their construction. Those chalet walls were very thin. They wouldn't hold a nail. And they were whitewashed in these Mediterranean salmons and turquoises to fight against the British summer. And it's true that when you stayed at a Butlin's holiday camp, they locked the gates at night and locked you in. A little like prison camp. But for a seven-year-old growing up, there was a wonderful, immersive experience about going to a Butlins. There were red coat entertainers in their competitions. There were these vast cafeterias where everybody sat down and ate their meals together. And there were cabarets and nightly ballroom dancing, actually, where I learned to waltz with my mother at a Butlins holiday camp. Billy Butlin when he designed these camps, seemed to have pulled in experiences from, from his travels all around the world and created a peculiar English variation of those things that he had seen. So, for example, at the Skegness Butlins, there was a monorail that was almost like a ghost train on a girder, but clearly an echo of Walt Disney's monorail over at Disneyland. The swimming pools at Butlins had glass sides, so you could sit and drink your double diamond and watch the people in the pool, an echo of some of those great uh, hotels in Miami from the 50s and 60s with glass sides. And most importantly, my favorite place, and the reason I'm wearing this ridiculous outfit today, is the Beachcoma Bar. Now, many of the Butlins had Beachcoma Bars, they were full-on Polynesian-style watering holes. And I would sit there drinking my pineapple juice while my parents would get these exotic-sounding cocktails delivered to them by waitresses in grass skirts and string bikinis and lays. Uh, the tiki gods would look down from the corners of the beachcomber bar, and everyone had a volcano. In the corner, on every 30 minutes, the volcano would erupt with thunder and lightning and this light show. And for a seven-year-old at that time, this was a, an incredible experience for me, an immersive world that I could step into and it felt like nothing ever, nothing I'd experienced before. And I could see the people around me also getting into that world, into this Polynesian faux culture at Butlin's holiday camp. Now, as I say, with all the other things that Billy Butlin's brought to Butlin's, um, the beachcomber bars were probably named after the guy that invented all this. Ernest Gant 
1934 in Hollywood created a bar called Don the Beachcomber. Became so famous that Don the Beachcomber eventually took the name of his creation. And I'll call him Don for the rest of this presentation. Um, with Don the Beachcomber, Don single-handedly invented not only tiki pop culture, but also the tropical cocktail. The tropical cocktail formed the heart of the experience of the tiki bar, this exotic rum concoction of secret ingredients with exotic names like the zombie or the Mai Tai. Everybody's heard of the Mai Tai right now. Don the Beach came a clone to invent both those cocktails. Um, so an amazing focal point around rum cocktails that had secret ingredients. Even the bartenders at Don the Beachcoma didn't know what was in those cocktails. We've had to reconstruct a lot of those cocktails in recent years. They would take bottle one, bottle two, and bottle three and add mixtures together to form the signature drink. This was kind of an anti-competitive thing, so anybody that went from Don to Don the Beachcomber's restaurant to one of his competitors, for example, Trader Vic's, the other big chain at the time, and there's still a Trader Vic's in London, in the Hilton today, um, couldn't take the signature drink with them. But it, it creates something much more. When you opened up the menu or went into the bar and asked about the cocktail, because you didn't know what was in that cocktail, what you got instead was the story, the origin story of the cocktail, and how Don and had wandered the South Pacific and found these exotic things and put them together. Some of these origin stories imbued the drinks with magical powers, and they always had these fantastic names, like uh, the Suffering Bastard or the Missionary's Downfall. And that was just one piece of an incredible intention to detail in the tiki bars, especially as they grew more popular. Uh, there were waterfalls, fountains, carvings. Um, in, uh, some of the popular ones would have uh, entertainment, Samoan fire dancers and hula girls performing nightly. The Tonga Room in San Francisco had a pool and a boat that went out into the pool and the band sat on the boat and it drifted out amongst the diners as water fell from the ceiling and drops landed on the water and you could hear the distant sound of lightning and thunder, kind of like Billy Butlin's Beachcomber Bar. These became really incredibly popular during the 40s and the 50s. Um, and what's going on here? This is... This is a lot of attention to detail, right? To build a restaurant, you don't need to go to all this trouble. But all this attention to detail was one of the reasons why they became so popular. If you have to think back to the period, this was a time of sexual repression, the 40s and 50s, a lot of co uh, uh, conduct of society when you would go out and how you'd interact with each other, very formal. The world that Don the Beachcomber created allowed people a story world in which to play, come into the tiki bar and be a different person. You could let loose. You could dress up. You could take your shirt off. You could flirt. You could interact with each other. You could become one with the story and put yourself at the center of that story, of this weird Polynesian culture. They even had a phrase for it. They called it going native. Uh, and you would come back with a tiki mug an artifact of this artificial world to remember the experience by. So it's kind of interesting that this exploration of story world and immersive storytelling was happening at a period when storytelling was really changing dramatically. Storytelling has always been kind of an immersive experience and an interactive experience where the audience participates. Those initial days around the campfire when you would take turns in telling stories to each other through the Greek amphitheaters that were maybe in the round so the audience formed a backdrop to some of the performance that was going on and became part of the experience. Those Shakespearean performances at the Globe, by all accounts, very bawdy sessions, people shouting, interacting, very immersive and participatory. But then came radio TV and film, a technology through mass media 
that for the first time really separated the storyteller and the audience through time and place. For the first time, audiences were told to sit down, to shut up, and to pay attention as the storyteller weaved his story, a kind of dictatorship of the auteur. In fact, you still see that a little bit today. You see some TV uh, program makers and filmmakers saying, you know, I don't want to know what my fans have to say. I don't really know what my audience wants to say. I have, I have my story to tell. I think we'll look back on the 20th century as that blip in the storytelling history where the audience lost its ability to participate. Mass media will be that small section because things are changing, right, dramatically. In the last five years, we've seen this technological revolution. It's happened on the web, it's happened uh, mobile, it's especially happened in social forums. It's a mechanical connectivity that allows us all to comment, to share, to tweet, to post our own photographs. And it's more than just a technical revolution, right? It's a social revolution. What it is is the gradual re-emergence of the voice of the audience that had been shut down by mass media, all right? As we're all changing, as we all turn from consumers into producers and to start participating and collaborating in that storytelling process. Now, Participating in story is more than just a comment. It's more than just using a hashtag during a show. It's more than just leaving your review or telling your friends what you thought of a movie. It's more than just a second screen experience when you're watching TV. Participation puts you very firmly in the story world, at the center of that story, sometimes as the hero or the heroine. We see it in the rise of video games, the rise of console games. For a whole generation, it's taking the place of TV in Hollywood. And at the center of the console game is the concept of the player as the hero, exploring a story world that slowly unfolds as you step into it. So in a way, it's kind of the same kind of story world that, that Don the Beachcomber allowed people to stand into. We're creating a layer of archaeology, of objects, and putting each individual into the middle of the story and allowing them to start to explore. Now, I, um, I work in the, role of, uh, in the world of transmedia. Um, transmedia storytelling as an emerging art form it's something for those that are immersed in it, very exciting and dynamic way to tell a story. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the phrase transmedia storytelling, it's defined as a story that moves from platform to platform, and you weave through those platforms and covering pieces of the story. So it may typically start online, it may go to a live event, it may resolve in a piece of video that's found, maybe a phone call that you make, and as an audience member, you participate in that world and unlock those pieces. And actually, that participation piece, the traveling across the channels under your own steam in either a linear way or a non-linear way is part of what makes transmedia storytelling kind of different from just multimedia. But there's another thing about transmedia storytelling that's really interesting, and that it, it starts to unfold a story in the way all our lives unfold. If you think about your own life, you go through this with this amazing set of sensory experiences, sights, sounds, tastes, smells. You meet people, have emotions, have interactions, events happen to you in a very chronological but very kind of non-linear way. It's a mass of data, which we at the center of our, our own story, we thread from A to B to C to tell that story to ourselves so we understand it. Then when we relate it back to somebody else, we pick the pieces of that data that's important and create that story. And that's kind of how transmedia storytelling works. Thread through, pick the pieces of data that are the most important, and create that story in your head. 
which means, in a way, suddenly we're all around the campfire again, you know? The role of storytellers becomes less about what happened to person A and what happened to person B and how they interacted, and then finally what happened to person C. As storytellers, it becomes more about building a story world, creating layers of archaeology that people can find and excavate and find the story within that layer of excavation. It's the work that we do at Campfire that reflects some of this. For example, for the, uh, for the first season of Game of Thrones, HBO's Game of Thrones, we created a, a sensory environment through touch, taste, smell, that allowed audiences to start to immerse themselves in the world of Westeros before Game of Thrones came to the screen. We did the same with HBO's True Blood, imagining the world where vampires are real and what that would feel like, what that, how you would experience that if that, that were real. Um, and a uh, 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 case study that I'm actually going to talk to mo about tomorrow at the Cross Media Summit, um, the, the imagination of a post-apocalyptic world in advance of a reality show called The Colony, where people could experience the world breaking down through their social network, through their friends and family, telling that story to them, putting themselves at the center of the experience. It's the heart of everything we do at Campfire. We have a group of brainstorm rooms that we go off to when we ideate with our creative teams, and one of them is literally a straw hut. And it has tikis, tiki mugs around the room, tiki idols looking down at us. And the reason for that is it reminds us that it's not just about connecting the dots and telling the story. It's trying to build a story world that's rich enough that people can lose themselves in, which is something game designers know, which is something that uh, Don the Beachcomber certainly knew. And it's a lesson which Billy Butlin knew when he built those original holiday camps. Thank you.